Okay, so this lesson is about the different types of chemical bonds, so the difference between ionic bond and covalent bond, and also polarity. All right, so we're going to basically review grade 11 concepts here, and we have to start with electronegativity because chemical bonds depend on their electronegativity. So what is electronegativity? So this is perhaps one of the most important concepts in chemistry because it explains so many things about our natural world, the behavior of different compounds. So the electronegativity simply is the tendency of an atom to attract neighboring electrons. So how good you are at attracting electrons, well, that is just your electronegativity. So an analogy would be, well, handsomeness, the tendency of a male to attract a female. So Justin Bieber would be an example of a handsome individual. He has a lot of fans, and a lot of fangirls would just flock towards Justin Bieber. Uh, so if Justin Bieber was an element, then he would have high electronegativity. So different elements have different electronegativities. Some of them are similar, uh, but generally they're different. And there is a trend on the periodic table that um, describes electronegativity. So as you can see in the top right corner, you have fluorine, that will be the Justin Bieber of the periodic table. Bottom left, you have the ugliest element, francium, the lowest electronegativity. So the trend is when you go to the right and up, electronegativity increases, whereas if you go to the left and down, electronegativity will decrease. Okay, the reason for that, well, we learned that in grade 11, honestly not all that important in grade 12, you just need to know what this is and how to look for it on the periodic table. So the important part about electronegativity is we need to look at the difference in electronegativity between two bonded atoms, okay? Now, when there is a difference in the electronegativity that determines the ionic or covalent characters of that bond. And to find the difference, all you have to do is subtract them. And you can look up the values of each element, their electronegativity on the periodic table. So I have a video explaining um, periodic trends and electronegativity. All right, so that was a summary on periodic trends and uh, just a review of electronegativity. Now, like I said, that um, the types of bond that you have, ionic or covalent, it depends on the electronegativities of the two bonding atoms. Right? And this picture summarizes that pattern. And you can see that instead of being black and white and being binary, either ionic or covalent, it's actually a spectrum, all right? It comes in gradations. If you have a large difference in your delta En, the difference in electronegativity, that means you have more ionic character in that bond. And if your difference in electronegativity is relatively small, then that means you have more covalent characters in your bond, all right? So it, it's not a black and white thing. It's not like you flip a switch, you go from covalent to ionic, okay? So there are things in the middle that have both ionic and covalent characters. So as you progress from one end to the other, you increase your ionic character or you increase your covalent character. And in this diagram, um, you can see what the magic numbers are. If you see, look at um, the, the, the thing on the bottom, 1.7, that's the cutoff for being an ionic bond, okay? If the electronegativity difference between two elements is greater than 1.7, you will be considered to be ionic. And if it's less than that, you will be considered to be covalent. And still, with covalent bonds, you have two different types. You can have polar or nonpolar covalent bonds. And um, if you have a nonpolar covalent bond, it simply means that the electrons are shared equally. Okay, everybody gets the same amount of electrons for the same amount of time. And if the difference is uh, large, that means between 0 0.4 and 
then you will have unequal sharing of electrons. So despite the fact that they're sharing, they're not sharing equally. So one atom has the advantage. They have the electrons closer to them for longer periods of time. So still sharing, but polar covalent. All right. So let's summarize this again. So if you have an ionic bond, the difference has to be great enough that it exceeds 1.7. Now, if this were to occur, the attraction of those electrons from one atom will greatly exceed the other atom. So as a result, those electrons will be stolen by the atom with the higher electronegativity. All right, so this is not sharing anymore. If you straight up steal the electrons, you can't call it the sharing, so that would be ionic and not covalent. Okay, does that make sense? All this has to do is um, with the force of attraction. In other words, electronegativity. Okay, high electronegativity, you have a higher tendency to attract electrons, so you're better at attracting, so electrons are closer to you. And this results in ionic bond. Now, if you have a covalent bond, that means no one is winning <laughs> So no one takes those electrons. So the difference in the electronegativity is small. There's still a difference, okay? But that difference is not enough for one of the sides to win this tug of war. And in grade 10, uh, we teach covalent bonds, like, you know, it's sharing and caring, like how atoms are sweet, you oh, you need an electron. Okay, here you can have mine, let's share. It's not like that, okay? what they're really trying to do is take the electron from each other. It's just that they're not strong enough to do that. So they're kind of stuck in this tug of war. So that's the covalent bond. So nobody's strong enough to completely steal the atom. So they compromise and the electrons get shared between the two atoms. So this is covalent bonds. All right, so any questions about this so far? All right, there are two types of covalent bonds. You can have a polar covalent bond and a non-polar covalent bond. So let's look at the polar one first. What do you mean by polar? Well, if the electronegativity difference is between 0 0.5 and 1.7, so it, there is a clear difference between the two, but that difference is not so big that one of them dominates the other, then you have a polar covalent bond. So the electrons are shared, but this is unequal sharing, and the electron is actually closer to one atom over the other, okay? And the higher electronegativity will obviously have the electrons closer to them, and as a result, you have delta negative on the more electronegative atom and delta positive on the more electropositive atom. So now there exists a tiny difference in their overall net charge. The overall molecule is still neutral, but the distribution of that charge is different. No, it's not uniform. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Now, what do I mean by delta negative? If you're delta negative, that means you're partially negative. It is not a full one minus. If you're a full one minus, that means you completely stole that electron, you become one minus, but you didn't. Right? You're still sharing. You have that electron most of the time, but you have to return that electron to the other atom sometimes. So you don't get the full benefit of the negative charge. So that charge is technically between negative one and zero. You're still negative. It's just that you're not fully negative. Uh, likewise, uh, with the positive charge, if you have delta positive, you're not having those electrons most of the time. So as a result, you're more positive than you should be. So, but still, uh, you didn't lose that electron entirely. That electron still comes back sometimes. So you don't have a full one plus. It's between zero and one plus. So you have a partial positive charge. All right. Does that make any sense? So we're talking about partial charges that can result from unequal sharing of electrons. So that's a polar covalent bond. The other type of covalent bond will be a non-polar covalent bond. This simply means the electrons are shared relatively equally. 
Okay. If you have similar electronegativity, and by similar I mean the difference is less than 0 0.5, you can even have a difference of 0. That means they're completely equal. Now, if, if it's not 0, no problem. As long as it's less than 0 0.5, the difference is too small okay, to make any significant, uh, to have a significant effect. So, effectively, they are equally shared between the two atoms, and they're found exactly in the middle between them. So you don't have any partial charges. The charge is uniformly distributed amongst the entire molecule. You will have a non-polar covalent bond. All right, so that's the difference between polar versus non-polar. So sharing is not simply sharing. There are different ways to share. So here is a summary of all of them again. You can have non-polar, uh, which is the equal sharing of electrons between two atoms. You can have polar covalent, that means the unequal sharing of electrons between two atoms. And finally, ionic, uh, the complete transfer of one you know, electron to another atom. And again, the numbers you need to know. It is polar if the electronegativity difference is between 0.5 and 1.7, nonpolar if it's less than 0.5 and ionic if it exceeds 1.7. All right, so do we have any questions so far? Okay, no. Where did these numbers come from? Is 1.7 a magic number? Um, it has any significance that we you know, use 1.7 or is it just an arbitrary number that we have to choose um, in order to draw a line? Well, the answer is latter. Okay, we have to draw a line somewhere. If you want to talk about ionic versus covalent bonds, well, you have to have a definition, right? So that means you have to pick an arbitrary value somewhere along the spectrum and decide that, hey, here's my line. If you're greater than this number, you gotta be ionic. If you're less than that number, you gotta be covalent. Okay, so that makes it convenient for us for semantic reasons. There's nothing special about that 1.7. That's where we decided to draw that line. This is akin to at what age do you become an adult? The law says 18, okay? If, if the clock strikes 12 on your 18th birthday, you officially become an adult and you unlock some new skills, okay? Some new privileges. But does it really make a difference biologically? Is there really a biological or psychological difference between a 17-year-old and an 18-year-old? Probably not. Okay, nothing magical happens to you on your 18th birthday. You're still you. You wouldn't see any difference in the mirror. You wouldn't have a change of mind. You're not going to have an epiphany. You're still you. Okay, it's just that the law changes for you because we decided we are, we, we got to draw the line somewhere. How do we determine you know, what a kid is and what an adult is? Well, let's just pick a number at 18. Different cultures, different time periods, they pick a different age. Okay, I mean, think in the past, 16 was the age um, with like drinking alcohol, for example, 19 in some provinces, 21 in the United States, you see what I mean? So this is completely arbitrary because we want to define something, we have to draw a line. So just keep in mind, this is a gradual continuous spectrum, okay? If you have electronegativity difference of exactly 1.7, well, that's arguable. You can call this ionic, but some people can say, well, this is, this is really covalent, but you know, strongly ionic characters. So again, it's murky. Same thing with the 0.5. It's just an arbitrary place. We have to draw the line. Okay, what is significant difference? What is not a significant difference? Okay, if, if I pluck one hair from your head, I don't think you would mind. If I pluck two, I don't think you would mind. You know, if I pluck 20, I don't know. If I pluck 100, you probably will get pissed and you know, do something about that. So what is that line? What is the significant difference? We just gotta pick a number and we pick 0.5. So I'm saying this just to remind you that this is a spectrum. Life is not black and white, okay? Covalent ionic is not binary. It's actually a spectrum. We want it to be binary for you know, our own benefits to make it simpler. So let's do some example questions. Determine whether each um, of these bonds are ionic, polar covalent, or non-polar covalent. So let's do them together. 
Um, if you don't have a periodic table open, I suggest you find one because that's where you will find the electronegativity difference and well, the electronegativity values. Okay, starting with the first one, C and O. Carbon has an electronegativity of 2.6. Oxygen is 3.4. If you do the math, you get a 0 0.8. What is it? Anyone? Polar covalent. That would be polar covalent. Okay. 0.8 is greater than 0.5, but less than 1.7. So it's quite clearly polar covalent. See how this works? If you have fluorine and iodine, I don't remember the electronegativity difference between those. Fluorine is four, iodine, I don't know. Um, if you just look on the periodic table, you should see it's 2.7. And you take the difference. The difference is 1.8, sorry, 1.3. So this is, again, polar covalent. All right, see, you see how this works? What about the next one? LIF. Well, fluorine is four, we know that, but what about lithium? Anybody? Four minus one. Four minus one, okay, and that's a three. So this is a whopping three difference. Okay, between the two electronegativities. And you only have to be a difference of 1.7 or greater, so obviously this is ionic. Now you might be thinking, does the grade 10 definition still work, right? Look, lithium and fluorine, metal, non-metal, that's ionic, that's what you learn in grade 10. Carbon, oxygen, like fluorine, iodine, those are all non-metal, so non-metal, non-metal is a covalent bond. That's what I learned in grade 10. So that still works, doesn't it? Can I just take a shortcut and just do the grade 10 definition instead? Because I really don't want to whip out the period table. I don't want to look. I don't want to do the math. Well, you'll see the answer to that with the next two examples. Uh, germanium and tin. If you want to use the grade 10 definition, well, germanium, I believe that's a metalloid, if not a metal. Tin is definitely a metal. So basically you have two metals. How can two metals bond? Like we never talked about two metals bonding before. So is that even possible? Well, yeah. Um, what type of bond is this according to our new definition? If you just look them up. To help you out, that's situated to the right, like in the P block. They're both two. Yeah, they're both two. They're exactly the same, right? So that means they have a zero difference. So that would be non-polar covalent. Now here is where your mind gets blown. Wait, what? Two metals have a covalent bond, what? Well, the next one should mess you up even more. Aluminum and chlorine. The electronegativity difference, please. 1.6. 1.6. So. Chlorine is 3.2, aluminum is 1.6, so the difference is 1.6. 1.6, by definition, means it is a polar covalent bond because it's less than 1.7, you see? If you were in grade 10, you asked this question to a grade 10 student, is aluminum, chlorine a covalent bond or ionic? They're going to say ionic because it's metal and non-metal. Aluminum's a metal, chlorine's a non-metal, so... By definition, that is ionic, but in grade 12, we actually reverse that answer and we say it's covalent. Now, again, this is all semantic because if you have a difference of 1.6, that's like arguing. You're 17 years old and you murder somebody. Should we put you in prison or should we put you in juvie hall? By law, it's juvie hall, but like 17, are you really that ignorant and not know the consequences of killing somebody? No, like you know what you're doing, but according to law, you're not an adult yet. You see what I mean? So if you really want to play by the rules, it is polar covalent. But if you want to make an argument that this is ionic, I mean, who's here to tell you you're wrong? So we have to pick a right answer. Now, you, you can't have an argument. So we say that this is polar covalent with a high ionic character. So we recognize that this is really close to an ionic bond. Um, but, you know, we still have to draw the line. So sorry, that's covalent. 
Okay, so if you draw the Lewis diagram of this, I've seen both. I've seen the ionic version. You just put it in square brackets and three chlorines, AlCl3. And I've seen uh, covalent structures where aluminum makes three covalent bonds with the chloride. And aluminum only needs three covalent bonds. It is one of those exceptions. It is exactly the same as boron. Okay, boron only needs six valence electrons. That's a special one. Aluminum, same thing for the same reason. Okay, so you can argue that aluminum also makes covalent bonds. So that actually blows our mind a little bit. Covalent bonds are no longer restricted to non-metals. Metals can do it. In fact, a lot of the transition metals, they have intermediate electronegativity. Right, so that means they are able to make covalent bonds. Okay, so just make sure that you use our new definition now, not the metal non-metal definition anymore. All right, so if you are polar, okay, you would have a dipole or a dipole moment. Now, what is a dipole moment? The definition of a dipole moment is a partial separation of charge. Okay, what does that mean in plain English? It means that you have partial charges, partial positives and partial negatives, and they are separated in the same molecule. So a dipole, we use, usually use that word for a magnet. Uh, magnets have dipoles the North Pole and the South Pole. The Earth is a giant magnet. The Earth has a North Pole and a South Pole. Now, in polar molecules, it is like a magnet. It has a positive end and a negative end, just like a magnet. Well, magnet has North and South, but you know, opposites attract and uh, like repel, same thing. So you can view this as a giant, or well, actually a tiny magnet. In this picture, the hydrogen is partially positive because fluorine is so bossy. It has an electronegativity difference of four. So it's going to take those electrons and put them really close to itself. So hydrogen, as a result, becomes partially positive. Fluorine is partially negative. And this generates a dipole moment. And we represent a dipole moment using an arrow. The arrow should point from the positive end towards the negative end. And at the positive end, we use a plus sign for the end of that arrow. The, uh, the tail of the arrow is a plus sign, just to remind you that this is the positive end. All right, does that make sense? So a dipole exists in a polar molecule well, with polar bonds. If you have a polar bond, you will have a dipole pointing towards the negative. Now, it is worthwhile to note before I move on, because I forgot to mention earlier, HF, right? because we are looking at HF right now, you might think that is ionic according to our definition, because 4 minus 2.2 is 1.8, which exceeds 1.7, so ionic, right? Well, actually, no, that's where we break the rule. Um, it is still polar covalent because they are still shared. So, yeah, that... That system is flawed. It's just a rule of thumb for us to you know, make a decision easier. It, again, like I said, if, if you're 19 years old, well, adult or kid, well, that's hard to say. So yeah, just keep in mind, HF, it's still um, polar covalent. Now we mentioned that bonds can be polar or nonpolar, but we didn't say anything about the entire molecule being polar or nonpolar. Okay, so bonds have polarity, but so do entire molecules. So if you look at the picture here, uh, HCl is being shown. Um, the green represents chlorine, the white represents hydrogen. That's the convention for the colors. HCl is polar because chlorine is more negative than hydrogen. And HCl being a gas, it will move in a random direction and it will be facing in a random direction as you're just moving around. So no organized pattern. However, if you place them between two plates of opposite charges, you will have an electric field that points in one direction. And if you put HCl in an electric field, the negative chlorine, because it's partially negative, it will point towards the positive plate, and the positive hydrogen will point towards the negative plate. It will become aligned with the electric field because the molecule itself is polar, 
All right, so molecules can be polar, not just their bonds. So we're gonna learn that next. There's a difference between nonpolar and polar molecules. We're talking about entire molecules now, not just individual bonds. So how do you tell whether a molecule is polar or not? Well, there are two questions that you ask, okay? And a molecule will be nonpolar if it satisfies just one of these two conditions. Okay, so what are the conditions? Well, the first condition, it is symmetrical. Okay. As long as you satisfy one, you are nonpolar. So if you're symmetrical, congratulations, you're nonpolar. You don't even care about what the other condition is. Well, let's just look at the other condition. The other condition is you have a low electronegativity difference. If the delta E n is less than 0.5, that means your dipole is very weak. And it is so weak, it doesn't really make a real difference. So we just say you're nonpolar anyway. So looking at the three uh, molecules on the bottom, CH4. Well, CH4 has a slight electronegativity difference. Okay, the difference is very small, but carbon is slightly more negative than hydrogen. That, that difference is very low. With that alone, we say you're nonpolar, okay? But let's say that difference is not small. E even if the difference is big, you're still nonpolar because you're symmetric. So that happens to satisfy both conditions. You don't need to satisfy both conditions, but you did. But the second one, a BF3, boron, has low electronegativity. Fluorine has the highest electronegativity. So the difference between fluorine and boron is huge. All right, so fluorines are very negative. That boron in the middle is very positive. So you have a large difference. You don't satisfy condition number two, but you're still nonpolar. Why? Because it satisfied condition number one. It is symmetrical. Okay, it is evenly distributed in all ways, in all directions. If you learn physics, imagine them as forces, force vectors. Okay, imagine like there's a cart in the middle, you have three donkeys pulling on that cart in those directions. Well, all the forces will cancel out exactly. You have a net zero force and the cart doesn't move. All right, see how this works? So given that it is symmetric, you still say that BF3 is nonpolar. Same thing with the next one, SF6. All the force vectors will cancel out. They all point in opposite directions. So the net dipole is zero. Despite having polar bonds, you have a nonpolar molecule. Right, did I make myself clear? All right. So molecules could be nonpolar despite having polar bonds due to symmetry. Now, the formula, how do you know if something's symmetric? Because like, sometimes it's not that obvious if something is symmetric. Here is a rule of thumb. Um, I'm going to use uh, BF3 as an example. How do you know that's symmetric? Well, I mean, it looks symmetric, but is there like a systematic way to determine whether something is symmetric? Well, yes. If you have a flat diagram instead of a Vesper diagram, because you might get a Lewis diagram instead of Vesper, you can still do it. Something is symmetric if you are able to draw two lines of symmetry, okay, at least two. That means you can draw a line of symmetry like this. I'm gonna draw on here. See, I just drew a line of symmetry. The molecule is symmetric on that line. You can reflect it back and forth. It's going to be the same thing. But if you can draw two or more, you are symmetric. So let me just draw another one. Look, I just drew another one. That's another line of symmetry. In fact, I could draw a third one with the third bar. But you only need two to be classified as symmetric. Okay, And you are able to draw two. So congratulations, you're symmetric. If you could just draw one, then you're not symmetric. Okay, So let's move on to polar molecules to show you what I mean. All right, so in order for something to be polar, you have to satisfy both of these conditions. All right, so this is different from previously. Previously, you just have to satisfy one. So let me just go back real quick. These conditions for nonpolar, we call them sufficient conditions. Okay, that means just having one of them is sufficient. 
That's a sufficient condition to be nonpolar. But for polarity, these conditions are necessary conditions. The difference is you need them, but doesn't mean it's enough. It's like food is necessary for survival, but is food sufficient for survival? No, you need water as well. You need warmth. You see what I mean? But food is necessary. It's not sufficient. So these, molecules, uh, these conditions are necessary. So that means you need to satisfy all of them. So number one, it has to be asymmetrical. You can't be symmetric. Okay? If you're not symmetric, good, you satisfy this condition. Not only that, you also have to have a large electronegativity difference. In other words, there must exist a net dipole in there somewhere. Only if you check both of these boxes, congratulations, you're polar. Okay? If you check one of these boxes, that's not enough. It's like you go to the airport, you want to fly to another country, you need a passport, and you need a plane ticket. If you just have one and not the other, you're not getting on the plane that day. Okay, you need both. So let's look at water. Water has delta negative on the oxygen because oxygen is way more negative than the hydrogen and hydrogen as a result is delta positive. Okay, if you draw the two dipoles, they should both point from the hydrogen to the oxygen, making a little triangle thing. And again, a recall vector addition. The net dipole is the sum of those two vectors. And if you want to add two vectors, you have to add up their horizontal and vertical components. Their horizontal components cancel out. That's a zero vector. Their vertical components, they add up. So the net dipole points upwards. Okay, in red, you have the net dipole moment. So that means you're not symmetric. You have a net dipole. It means you're polar. The oxygen side is more negative than the hydrogen side. All right, does that make sense? For ammonia, same story. Nitrogen is more negative than the hydrogens. So nitrogen bears a partial negative. The hydrogens all have a partial positive. But is the whole thing polar? Yes. If you check out those three dipole moment vectors, they all point towards nitrogen, like a little pyramid. The horizontal components all cancel, but the vertical components, they add up. So the net dipole moment still points up. All right, so you do have a non-zero net dipole. You're also polar. So how do you determine something is symmetric or not? If you have a Lewis diagram, well, that water is a Lewis diagram. If you can just draw one, line of symmetry right there. I just drew a line of symmetry down the middle. If you flip it back and forth, it's the same thing. I'm unable to draw another one. There's no way for me to draw another line of symmetry. I can only draw one, then you're asymmetrical. Does that make sense? So to be symmetric, you, may, you must be able to draw two lines of symmetry. All right, so I hope I made myself clear on how to distinguish, uh, distinguish between polar versus non-polar molecules. This is vitally important for you to know because polar molecules and non-polar molecules have drastically different properties and behavior. All right, if you can't you know, get those two you know, clear, then you're going to get a lot of questions wrong. All right, so let me show you another example. Carbon dioxide is supposed to be a nonpolar molecule, but it has polar bonds. Okay, the carbon is delta plus, the oxygens are delta minus because oxygen is more negative than high of the carbon. So you have two dipole moments. One points to the oxygen to the left, the other one points to the right. So you do have polar bonds. None of those bonds are non-polar, they're all polar. But the entire molecule is non-polar because they cancel out. You have a net dipole moment of zero, whereas for water, they add up, they don't cancel out. You see what I mean? So you have to have a symmetry and an electronegativity difference. All right, so let's do example two together just to uh, practice. The first one, top left corner, HCl, polar, nonpolar. Hold on. All right, so HCl, polar or nonpolar? Polar. 
that would be polar, okay? Because chlorine is more negative than the hydrogen, okay? So that's polar. Um, ammonia on the right side, oh, we did that one already, but it came with pictures. Polar, non polar? Polar. Polar, right? Again, they all point towards the nitrogen, but notice that this is not flat. If it was flat, it would be non polar, but this all goes up, so that is polar. The middle one, CCL4. Non polar. That would be non polar because everybody cancels out. You see how this works? There are four dipole moments and they all go in opposite directions. And if you're something in the middle and there are four things pulling you in those directions, you will not move. So non-polar. BF3. Non-polar. Non-polar. Okay, that's correct because they all pull in a direction such that they all cancel out. Okay, if you do the math, if you do the vector sum, you should get a zero vector. And lastly, carbon with one chlorine but three hydrogens, what is that? Polar. Okay, that would be polar. Uh, the geometry does look like it's symmetric, but chlorine has more electronegativity than the hydrogen, so it's not symmetric, so that would be polar. Okay, so is it clear? which molecules are polar, which molecules are not. Why don't the hydrogens have the arrows on them? Oh, um, it's, the, the picture just didn't come with it. It should have the arrows on them. Okay. It's relatively easy to do it's questions like this if you have the diagram already. You can just look at the diagram and decide whether it's polar or not. But if you don't have the diagrams and you have the chemical formulas, that means you have to draw the diagrams, then determine whether it's polar or not polar. It's a little bit harder. And if you happen to draw the Lewis diagram wrong, that's why I stressed bond angles for the Lewis diagrams are important. If you screw that up, you're gonna get the wrong polarity. You're gonna get the question wrong. So please practice this. I will take this up in um, seven, eight minutes. All right, so go ahead and work on this. Draw the diagram and tell me whether it is polar or not. Okay, so you have to first draw the Lewis diagrams and then determine the polarity. So for the first one, HBr, uh, it's quite simple. You just draw something like this. You only have two atoms. They must be connected and um, six non-bonding electrons for the bromine. So is this polar or non-polar? Guys? Polar? Polar. That will be polar. Okay, I don't remember what the electronegativity of bromine is, but you know, definitely have a huge difference uh, from hydrogen. So that is polar because it's asymmetric and it has a difference in electronegativity. So the next one, nitrogen, will be a triple bond. Uh, polar or non-polar? Non-polar. Non-polar. So this is a really silly question because it has one single element. So obviously you're going to have the same electronegativity difference. So you're going to be non-polar always. Now the next one can trip people up. Uh, is it polar or non-polar? Polar. That will be polar. If you said polar, then you didn't fall for the trap. The diagram looks like this. Many will be tempted to draw a straight line for the Lewis diagram. So I'm going to draw the wrong diagram right here. You might want to draw this. Okay, I just want to say that this is incorrect. If you draw something like that, then you see, oh, wait, it's linear. So all the dipoles cancel. And so that means it's nonpolar, right? Well, if you draw like that, then you're gonna realize, wait, it's not symmetric, so it's polar. But there's another issue with that answer. That issue is the electronegativity between the sulfur and the hydrogen is quite small. If you look it up, I think it's 0.4. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, because I initially thought this was polar until somebody pointed out, wait, but the difference is too small. Like, oh crap, I didn't really check, so. Actually, it's nonpolar. 
because the difference is just 0.4. Right, but then again, you can make that argument, well, 0.4 is kind of on the fence, right? So it is non-polar, but kind of polar. You see what I mean? It is not significant, but you know, it's almost getting there. So by definition, uh, it is non-polar. So let's follow the definition here. So I'm going to argue that this is non-polar. Although if you want to say that's polar, I see your point, but that's not what the definition says. Okay, so next, C2H6, what is it? Polar, non-polar? Non-polar. That will be non-polar. Okay. Why is it non-polar? Well, first of all, you draw the Lewis diagram and it looks like that. Um, you have to know that this is this is not the accurate diagram. This is not what the 3D one should look like. They don't have any 90 degree angles, despite what the diagram might suggest. But a Lewis diagram, despite being inaccurate in the bond angles, it can still tell you whether it's polar or not. This is symmetric. Okay, you can draw two lines of symmetries and you can see that this is symmetric. And because you have carbon hydrogen, they have a small difference to begin with, so this is non-polar. And this fact is important because later on, you're gonna learn organic chemistry and you're gonna learn about hydrocarbons. So basically long chains of just carbon and hydrogen, and they're all non-polar because of this reason. They're asymmetric and B, the difference is simply too small in their electronegativity. So gasoline being a hydrocarbon is non-polar. All right, C2Cl4. What is that one? Polar? Non-polar? Non-polar. Well, why am I getting two answers? Non-polar. If you actually draw it out, it's non-polar, okay, because it's perfectly symmetric. You can draw two lines of symmetries here, and the bond angles are all 120 degrees, despite that there is a difference between chlorine and carbon in their electronegativity. The symmetry canceled that out. Okay, so you're non-polar. Is it wrong yeah. if I put the carbons in like a flat line, or do I need to make them diagonal? What do you mean by a flat line? Like yours are like on an angle, <laughs> they're diagonal. Oh, on an angle. Okay, um, it doesn't matter. Like it's. <laughs> To be fair, I downloaded this picture, uh, these pictures from the internet. Okay. Why did I choose these molecules in particular? Because I was able to find consistent artistic styles for these Lewis diagrams. I just wanted to make it aesthetic. <laughs> so I chose these, not because I wanted to choose them, because I found pictures for them. So yeah, in the, in the drawing, it's angled. It doesn't really matter. Okay. okay, last one, pH3. I hope you realize it looks like that. Polar, non-polar. Polar. 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 Why do you say it's polar? I said it's non-polar. Oh, it says non-polar. Yeah, you're, if you said non-polar, then you're right. It is non-polar. It looks polar because ammonia has the same structure. Instead of P, you have an N, and that's polar. So it is asymmetric, okay? But phosphorus and hydrogen have, I believe, the same electronegativity, if not like a difference by the 0.1, insignificant. Okay, so that's why it's non-polar. All right, so I hope um, this exercise made you understand polarity a little bit better. Do we have any questions? No? All right. Um, the next part is a video. So I'm going to show you a video that summarizes uh, bonding. All right, um, so this is the end of this lesson. So we talked about electronegativity um, and how that affects ionic versus uh, covalent and polar covalent, non-polar. Um, how to determine whether a molecule is polar and what a dipole is. So do we have any questions before we go? We don't, okay. All right, so I'm gonna end the video here.